All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Rachel Roth. I am the vice president of Wichita Audubon Society. And tonight we have a, what will be an outstanding program by our special guest that we have here today. Um, before I introduce him and we get into the program, just a quick announcement from Audubon. We do have one more program for this season of our Audubon program series. That's going to be next month, May 18. I can't believe it's May already. Uh, same time, same place. We're going to be hearing from Dr. Robert Penner about shorebirds in the tall grass prairie. And speaking of the prairie, uh, that brings us right to tonight's presentation. So Brad, I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce yourself and tell us what you're going to be talking about. Sounds good. Thank you, Rachel. Appreciate it. Uh, well, I'm excited to <clears throat> be able to network uh, with this group uh, that I have I've so admired. Uh, uh, the birding group uh, across Kansas uh, just inspires me on a regular basis about uh, really connecting uh, with the landscape and uh, the wildlife and uh, being in touch with phenology uh, to such uh, an, an, an intensive and, and detailed uh, way that uh, I am just uh, in, in total awe of, of the birding community. And uh, I'm glad that one of the, you know, the strongest uh, elements of that in communities is, is right here close to Wichita. So uh, I'm from Newton. Uh, my name is Brad Gore. I'm the education coordinator at Dick Arboretum of the Plains in Heston, Kansas, uh, which is only about, uh, about 40 miles uh, north, a little bit west of Wichita. And um, we are a 40 year old, uh, almost a 40 year old organization. We'll turn 40 this fall. And uh, I will I'll say a little bit more about the Dick Arboretum and, uh, and some of my uh, interest and background. And I think I'll just do that with getting started with the presentation. All right, well, here we go. Uh, go Native, Restoring the Ecology of Backyard for Birds. So I'm not going to be doing a lot of talking about birds uh, because I know that this is a community that uh, could, could teach that course many times over uh, about uh, birding and, and uh, being able to you know, find, find the rare birds and, and know when they're coming and so forth. But uh, one of the things that is uh, exciting for me is figuring out how to attract these birds and do that in, in an urban setting uh, along with all other kinds of wildlife. So that's going to be the basis of my presentation, coming at it more from uh, a plant basis and uh, kind of ecological restoration. So uh, I do that from the platform of Dick Arboretum of the Plains in Heston. And our mission statement is to cultivate transformative relationships between people and the land. And that is a, a, a very meaningful uh, mission statement uh, uh, for me and, and for the people that we get to interact with, because it very cl closely ties to uh, uh, the land ethic that is described by Aldo Leopold in Sand County Almanac, uh, where to... uh, if, if you not, are not familiar with it, uh, check it out. He was uh, a conservationist. Of in the early 1900s uh, up until I think the book was published in the 1940s. And this is just a, a seminal piece of work and, and really connecting in with, with how people uh, interact with the land and, and thinking about the land as community and thinking about that community, not only including uh, people, but including the, the elements of the landscape as well. So the uh, the air, the soils, the, the, the vegetation, the wildlife, the, the whole ecosystem that exists on the land. And so I, I find that really meaningful in our work as we go forward. And I'll say more about some of the things that we do uh, to try to help carry out this mission. Uh, the, uh, my background uh, that I bring to this is a, a bit more in botany and uh, ecological restoration and uh, thinking about the, the prairie uh, from that standpoint, uh, did that work at the University of Wisconsin? And that's a, a lot where, you know, where Aldo Leopold's work took place. And uh, that, was, that was really uh, shaping for me. 
uh, as I thought about uh, vocational uh, interests and going forward. And that connection to the land is something uh, that keeps resonating with me. So ecological restoration and trying to figure out how to uh, pass that along to our membership and the people we interact with at Dick Arboretum is a big part of, of what I'm interested in. Um, a big piece of that programming that I do is a program called Earth for Schools, where we train teachers to restore prairie gardens on school grounds. And uh, working with these K through 12 educators is also very meaningful as we, uh, we teach them how to restore these gardens and these uh, ecological places in urban areas and to try to figure out how to connect their kids and their students in that process. So uh, that is a, another meaningful element uh, in the work that I get to do as, uh, as education coordinator uh, at the Arboretum. Uh, this is just showing some of the, the cohorts of, of teachers that we've been able to work with over the, the last 14 years. And so uh, what you see in these, these different cohorts are people that are, are interested in, in um, engaging more with that connection with the land and figuring out how to help their students uh, realize that as well. There's some literature uh, recently, uh, Richard Louvre, Last Child in the Woods, especially uh, drives it home uh, poignantly uh, that uh, you know, kids are getting more and more disconnected from the natural wor world around them. And uh, we hope that with this kind of programming where kids are, are engaged both in mind and body, uh, get their hands dirty as they explore and learn about plants and wildlife and, and doing that on their school grounds and places where they can interact it with those areas and on a regular basis has, has been a really meaningful work for us at the Arboretum. And more than half of the teachers you see in this slide have been, um, are from the, the, the Wichita area. So uh, if you know of any teachers or uh, uh, you know of somebody personally that would be interested in, in participating in this kind of a, uh, a training and education, uh, please let me know because uh, those are the kind of uh, people we're looking for with this Earth Partnership for Schools program. I also uh, carry this uh, home uh, to my work and uh, my work in trying to uh, uh, engage personally in, in just the fun of what I know to be trying to think about how to uh, to make urban spaces uh, more more ecologically friendly areas and uh, and enjoying that in my personal time and work time kind of uh, tends to, to bleed together quite a bit and so I'm always thinking about um, what how we might try to better cultivate that relationship between the land um, uh, wherever we are and, and at different, different times of, of um, existence as well. Uh, <laughs> Rachel sent me this, uh, this meme or posted it on my uh, Facebook page uh, recently and I really uh, got a kick out of it. But uh, this is the first screen of that meme. People making classic garden suggestions uh, as this bus just makes its way waywardly way onto the train tracks. And here's me uh, with uh, the drumbeat of native plants. Uh, sometimes it does feel that kind of way. And uh, this, this meme just made me uh, laugh out loud when I saw it. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, we do this unapologetically of getting native plants out there and trying to get it in people's uh, uh, experiences as much as possible. And, and it really is based on, I think, some, some sound ideas. Uh, when we think about ecological systems and trying to restore ecology, uh, as we think about our urban areas and, and trying to make these uh, more biodiverse friendly places, we have to think of them as, as ecosystems in, in, in and of themselves. Uh, these urban areas, uh, the, the more we want to attract wildlife, we have to be thinking about the building blocks of, of what builds these ecosystems. And so at first I you know, kind of used this as an ecosystem web uh, that came from a temperate deciduous forest, a sort of background, but it doesn't seem to really accurately portray uh, the, the things that I would want to be saying about trying to have an ecosystem that is um, more stable with soil, uh, cleaning the air and water and creating healthier food systems. So probably a little bit more uh, or a better example would be thinking of, of that prairie ecosystem and this food web that's more of like a pyramid in its shape because uh, the base really should be the strongest and thinking about uh, the, the producers and the plants. And the more biologically diverse that base of producers is, is the more it is going to support uh, in the different tiers and, and tertiary 
the uh, trophic levels of, of consumption uh, that get built into that, that food web. So uh, that is kind of a better way of thinking about it for me as, as we look at shaping our urban systems and our backyards uh, to try to attract wildlife. So uh, this is an extreme example of what you might see in sort of a suburban area, but it does drive home that idea that um, it's easy to not think about uh, the, the, the wildscape or the surrounding uh, kind of ecological uh, system uh, when we think about our urban built environment. And so being more mindful of that in the way that we design uh, urban areas and being able to think about, uh, as Aldo Leopold would say, that the, the landscape and its elements and the, the soils and the plants and the wildlife are all an important part of that community, that, that thinking and, and breathing system around us. And so uh, thinking more along the lines of like what Sarah Stein uh, did when she wrote her book, Noah's Garden, Restoring the Ecology of Our Own Backyards, uh, would be a little bit of a softer approach in thinking about how, how we might include wildlife and natural systems into uh, the design of our urban areas where you can see here, uh, you know, the, the backyards are, are more thoughtfully put together. Uh, they can provide green space corridors where wildlife might be able to migrate and it places maybe in what it would be a smaller footprint of, of, the, of the built environment uh, in there. But also thinking about other things like, you know, uh, amount of impervious surfaces and, and so forth. And I realize that that is a, can be a bit loaded with, uh, you know, with socio socioeconomic systems. And of course, you can afford larger uh, parcels uh, when you have more affluent areas. But uh, uh, in general, when we think ecologically, uh, uh, trying to think uh, with the landscape in mind is a healthy way to approach that. And here in Kansas, one of the ways we would do that to think about our landscapes would be to think about the model prairie uh, that existed here for thousands of years and the, the, the forces that, that shaped that system. You know, the, the regular disturbance that helped keep the prairie as prairie for, you know, much of the last 10,000 years since the last ice age. Uh, and the, 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 the disturbance elements of, of fire and grazing as really important elements of keeping prairie as prairie. And that's what you would see throughout the, the central part of uh, the Great Plains um, corridor of, of prairie through the central states that were shaped by the rain shadow uh, effect of the Rocky Mountains where uh, you know, the, the weather systems coming over the Rocky Mountains created that, that, that uh, absence of rain or that shadow uh, of rain, where it took a while for uh, weather systems to build up more precipitation as you move away from the Rockies. So you see in our annual precipitation map of Kansas that the, uh, it, uh, you know, more like eight to 10 inches of rainfall in Western Kansas, uh, maybe 20 to 30 inches in Central Kansas, and maybe as much as 40 to 45 inches in Eastern Kansas, as you get away from that Rocky Mountain rain shadow and get more influence of Gulf air masses and Canadian air masses colliding over the plains and picking up more, more moisture through storms and systems as you get away from that Rocky Mountain effect. But it, it shapes uh, Kansas very distinctly uh, in our, our precipitation zones. And then subsequently, as you might expect, our, our vegetation uh, that we see across Kansas as well. This is a uh, uh, Kukler's original 1974 ve vegetation map of Kansas that highlights that, uh, you know, as, as you probably know well, uh, western Kansas is short grass prairie. Central uh, areas are, are mixed grass prairie to tall grass prairie going further east. And then you get into oak woodlands and oak ecosystems in the east, very much mirroring uh, what you see with that that precipitation uh, map of Kansas. So um, when we think about how we want to landscape uh, our places and knowing the soils that we have and the climate that we have, especially here in South Central Kansas, uh, we think of an ecosystem that can do so much more than ways maybe many of us were taught uh, to garden in, in, you know, uh, in whiskey barrels or, or little pots or whatever around our homes, uh, that to garden with annuals. and uh, these can be aesthetically pleasing. They uh, can attract some pollinators, uh, but uh, it really, it kind of stops there. It's just basically the eye candy that is, that is a bit shallow. 
And if we think about uh, other models and we think about the prairie in particular, we think about uh, a much richer story of how we can landscape and enhance the ecology uh, of our urban areas if we think about those native plants. And so, you know, these native plants are, are native and do well here because of these massive root systems, uh, you know, uh, five, eight, 10, 12 feet deep root systems uh, that these plants take many years to develop in uh, uh, perennial uh, growth forms that, uh, you know, allow them to live for uh, decades or more. And uh, so that is part of the success of that uh, of that kind of a plant community that we might want to choose uh, for our urban systems. And it does, it does take time to develop those. I, I want to be uh, clear on that, but uh, it is something if you plan for it, it does provide those rewards uh, uh, for, for many years to come. And you can also think about uh, the, the richer story that helps when you think about native plants developing a bit more of a sense of place, you know, teaching us about uh, the cultural history of Kansas, how indigenous people, uh, you know, were working uh, very much in sync in many ways with uh, the ecosystem uh, that had developed in these places with the plants and the wildlife. And, and when you help, um, you know, kids understand and see the lights turn on when they understand you know, that the prairie was the, the grocery store, it was the, the hardware store, it was the pharmacy. Now you think of, uh, you know, a plant like uh, Echinacea angustifolia here in the bottom left, uh, you know, the medicine plant that uh, the seeds and uh, the roots, you can chew on them, uh, make your teeth go numb, uh, possibly curing uh, other kind of ailments. Uh, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, sod houses and what uh, Europeans in the 1800s uh, coming onto the scene, how they too had to try to figure out how to, uh, you know, utilize uh, the, the prairie and, and to try to interact with it in ways for survival and, and also sustainability. Uh, and then you just see a couple of examples of food plants here. Purple poppy mallow uh, has this tuberous root. Uh, we dig it up and kind of uh, fry it with a little butter or, or say bison fat or something. It's like fried potatoes. Add some prairie onion or prairie garlic to it. Uh, many different uh, foods uh, and, and medicines that can be found in the plants and then in the, in the wildlife, uh, other uh, food elements and, and sort of hardware store elements as well. So that, that cultural connection also adds a, a, a deeper and richer element of, of sense of place as we think about how we want to landscape. And then we think about our our economy and our existence in Kansas today of what makes our, our economy tick. And it has a lot to do with the legacy left uh, by those deep rooted soils of, uh, you know, that the prairie helped establish over thousands of years. We are the breadbasket of the world uh, because of the prairie. And when you turn that rich uh, 10 foot deep A horizon of soil, uh, it's very easy to grow uh, monoculture crops like you know, uh, wheat and corn and milo that are in the grasses family. I uh, think about uh, soybeans and, uh, you know, um, uh, this little legume here, uh, <laughs> flanking on the name of it. Uh, the, these plants in the, in the, the legume uh, family. And, uh, you know, and then you get uh, sunflowers too. The, uh, uh, these are, are the main families of the prairie, and it's, it probably should come as no surprise that, that we can grow, uh, you know, plants from, from the grass family and from the, the legume family and the sunflower family here. And, you know, and, and thanks to that prairie history, it is why we are in the top three regularly in producing wheat in the state and also beef production uh, that also takes advantage of the prairie. So, um, Yes, these are, uh, we have much to be thankful for the prairie and landscaping with these native plants is a way of connecting to that history and paying homage to that system. And, uh, and you can see here uh, with the, the, some of those, you know, those same families, the grasses, the legumes, the, uh, the sunflower family are, are deeply represented and are three of the, of the more common and, and greatly represented uh, families that you see in the prairie. And it should become as no surprise that we uh, can grow plants uh, in our, our food systems uh, in those areas as well um, um, too. 
So let's get into some of the plants uh, from these model systems since we do grow prairie really well here and you may have sunny, very sunny elements in your landscape. Think about prairie plants that uh, would do well or, or some that might be, you know, existing a little bit into that sort of savanna uh, type element of, of a little bit of shade. But many of these species here uh, just you can go through sometime later if you want to come back and look at this uh, at this slide. But these are many of the things that are just starting to bloom in my yard right now, or or things that I will have blooming uh, soon. Uh, you know, with that early blooming, uh, you know, some just barely even in March, but for sure in April and getting into May, uh, you're going to have species that are are short in stature and uh, and you know really uh, not overwhelming species to take over uh, in any garden. And so a lot of species here that, that do really well. Uh, and, and it's hard for me to choose a favorite from, from any one of these. And they each have their stories of hosting insects uh, with their vegetation. They have uh, great pollination mechanisms. Of course, they have many different colors that you can see here. And uh, it's just so much joy that I get in thinking about uh, you know, propagate, propagating and growing and spreading uh, these plants uh, as I see them uh, mature and develop in my landscape. So lots of, of, of great options uh, to choose from here in the, the spring blooming uh, prairie uh, elements. We get into summer and you, you have a, a whole new suite. And it's not just like three different categories, spring, summer, fall, because it's this continuum of continually uh, uh, plants blooming and setting seed. And, you know, on average, you're going to see each of these perennial species bloom for about two weeks. And then they go through, uh, you know, a seed production process if they were pollinated and and eventually dormancy. But uh, each, each element of that development is just interesting and uh, and fun to follow. And so here you see a number of great species as well. You get uh, this uh, taller liatris in the background there. You get some gray-headed coneflower, uh, some compass plant, uh, some rattlesnake master, black-eyed Susans. Uh, you get some purple prairie clover, some echinaceas. They're, they're, they're all in there and they're great species uh, to landscape with uh, in our in our urban landscapes. And, uh, you know, we can, we'll talk a little bit later about how some of these might get organized and, some, and so forth and different styles that you may uh, uh, try to approach in your, your landscaping uh, design methods. But uh, these are definitely some of the favorite species that, that I would choose as just uh, great species that um, uh, are, are beautiful, they attract wildlife, um, most of them are are pretty well behaved. Uh, bee balm can 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 get a little crazy on you, but it's an easy one to pull. And it uh, anyway, there are so many great things about all these plants that I'll 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 leave it at that. I uh, think we get into fall, a whole other suite of species. The grasses really start to assert themselves. The warm season grasses, of course, uh, are are blooming as you get into you know late July, August, and September. Uh, you get some of the colorful fall forbs of, you know, many species in the sunflower family, like the goldenrods and some of the later of uh, the gay feathers or the liatris. Uh, this is a uh, goldenrod in the yellow, probably at least rigid goldenrod. There may be a second species in there somewhere. Uh, the, the blue salvia or pitcher sage uh, is, is a plant in the mint family. And, uh, and then many, many of the grasses that you see here as well. A couple of more that, uh, in addition to the goldenrod and pitchered sage, uh, the liatris I mentioned, you get a, a number of asters too in the fall uh, that, that are really uh, showy and provide uh, lots of nectar for uh, insects late into the season. And especially because they time really well with the migration, the Southern migration of the monarchs uh, during uh, the fall as well in Kansas. So uh, very rewarding, uh, interesting species here to choose from the fall palette. So as you think about designing, if you have a sunny area and want to include uh, some uh, plants that give you a, a full season of a full growing season of interest from spring uh, into summer and then fall, uh, these are some of the great standards that you can choose. And there are so many more, uh, you know, probably upward of, of a couple of hundred different species uh, when it comes to uh, native plants that you can landscape with. And then don't forget about, uh, you know, the vegetation and the, the enjoyment of fall. Of course, we had this uh, odd 
uh, April 20 snowstorm this morning and uh, to wake up with a couple of inches of snow and see that instead of just being of uh, covering a, <clears throat> a, a monoculture of a fescue in a lawn, uh, you get to see it uh, cover and, and uh, take the, the shapes of these native plants in your landscape as well. It's just another way of enjoying it. And the wildlife does too. I mean, you think about all the overwintering of you know, insects and, and cover for, for birds and small mammals and, and everything else. Uh, it's just uh, the, the, the seasons aren't limited to just the, the, the growing season on their interest and enjoyment of, of native plants. So uh, revisit Kukler's map one more time and think about more of that Eastern Kansas influence of, of vegetation. You know, uh, here we are in, you're in Sedgwick County and I'm in Harvey County, just to the north of you. Uh, we are definitely in that tall grass, uh, that zone and, you know, 20 to 30, 30, just kind of inches of rain annually, but we still can easily grow many of the elements that you would find in Eastern Kansas, more of the woodland, oak savanna elements too. So we think about maybe some shadier elements of our landscape as well, uh, also offer many uh, unique uh, opportunities uh, in our landscaping with native plants. So this is, a, this is just a, a, a progression of ecosystems uh, shown in a, an ecological restoration book I have, uh, Packard and Mutal, uh, restoring the tall grass prairie that shows uh, just uh, some of the differences in in sort of structure and some of the animals uh, that that you see attracted uh, to these different systems. But I really find this to be a, a fascinating way to think about how we might be able to expand our landscaping as we think about uh, uh, you know adding shade elements into our landscape, which we all love to have uh, in our our landscapes and you know having different layers of shrubs and trees and and how that can attract different uh, 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 wildlife and 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 birds and all the other critters as well and that also comes with uh, trying to plant different plants underneath those understories as well so I can't get into all the details, but this is just a little bit about sort of ecosystem function and thinking about how we might think as we expand our, our, our landscaping possibilities. And I'll just show you some, some pictures of, of what some of those maybe ecosystem structures might look like. And, and these would be uh, oak savannas uh, that would have been common uh, in Eastern Kansas. You can still see great examples of it along uh, uh, major river corridors in, in our area. So like areas along the, the Ark River, the Cottonwood River, uh, some of these places where you still see these open grown bur oaks that would have been historical uh, evidence of uh, more of these oak savanna, this mixing of prairie and woodlands or this inter uh, intersection of the two. And it's not just a, a a, a, you know, a, a binary kind of transition from prairie to woodlands. You get this, this, uh, um, uh, this nice continuum uh, that in, includes oak savanna in the middle, and it, it creates uh, micro habitats for great diversity when you get modeled sunlight and, and different plants that can come into those systems too. So uh, just some more uh, images showing uh, some of these uh, kind of examples. Here's one uh, closer to Lawrence uh, Baldwin Woods. Uh, and a little bit further east and north of us. Uh, but this is right just outside of Heston, Kansas. So uh, you can see some of these open grown bur oaks and, and the system or, or the, the shape that they can take when they, when they have plenty of sunlight uh, to expand those branches and that to sort of filtered light that they allow as they uh, uh, support kind of uh, unique understory layers as well. And these are some of the things that uh, Doug Tallamy talks about. Uh, uh, Professor Tallamy uh, teaches, I think, at University of Vermont, and uh, he has written um, a few books now, uh, th these two being sort of foundational in, in, in their inspiration for uh, kind of bringing uh, nature into our, our urban uh, landscapes and, and doing that with the plants that we plant, that it takes native plants to attract of uh, the wildlife systems that we're looking for. And, uh, you know, he, he shows that uh, US has, has turned 54% of the lower 48 states into cities and suburbs and 41% more into various forms of agriculture. So in other words, we uh, really have taken 95% of that original native habitat. And uh, not maybe 
much in, in Kansas and in the plains where we have a little bit more of that native ecosystem um, uh, left uh, to enjoy, but uh, certainly uh, much of it has been altered. And so thinking about how to uh, bring that, uh, those natural ecosystems back into our urban areas is something that, that he does uh, very eloquently. And he does it a lot in talking about birds. Uh, about how birds uh, need carotenoids, they need caterpillars, uh, in and many of the, you know, the the birds that are that are raising young are definitely in that caterpillar eating stage, and uh, you know here are some of the different traits that uh, you know eating caterpillars uh, has a benefit for birds, and so uh, helps us better understand uh, the food systems that if we want to have nesting birds as part of our ecosystems in our urban areas, that we de definitely need to be encouraging uh, uh, plants that attract caterpillars and insects. And uh, caterpillars are the most in-demand food source for 16 out of 20 bird families, uh, according to a citation of, of Dr. Talamese, and that, that uh, a pair of birds, and he uses a uh, I think uh, uh, Eastern chickadees or Carolina chickadee as, a, as an example that 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars are needed to successfully rear one clutch of, of babies. And so those carotenoids are, are, in, are just imperative uh, to that process. And so native plants are needed. And so um, also states that 96% of terrestrial birds rear their young on insects. And so uh, if we are going to wanting to be having insects uh, in our urban systems and uh, these birds are not going to travel far to, to look for those insects, so they need to be close by if they're going to raise those, those clutch of young, then uh, we need to have the host plants. And in um, most cases, those host plants are native plants uh, that uh, help host insects. He just came out with uh, this, his latest book uh, here in March of the nature of oaks. And he really uh, touts, and oaks, uh, touts oaks very highly as, uh, as, as hosting, as one of the, the greatest hosts for, for insects. And uh, oaks is his top uh, genus, uh, cherries would be his second and, and willows his third. But uh, we're, we're talking about genera here that, that really um, have very palatable uh, uh, vegetation and fruits, and uh, they, they really do a good job of hosting insects, much better than what you'd see in like the landscape industry might have us believe in, in Bradford pears and crepe myrtles and boxwood, boxwoods and, and things like that. So, so thinking native again is really helpful for building that, the, the, the food web uh, that we're trying to do. And we have some great resources locally here that can guide us in the sort of species that we might want to choose. Uh, there are three really good ones. Uh, trees, shrubs, and woody vines in Kansas is one that, uh, that Mike and Craig uh, just, uh, just recently came out with a couple of years ago. And this is a, a great resource uh, uh, redoing H.A. Uh, uh, Stevens' uh, a uh, book that was uh, 50 years old. And so this is a, a fantastic resource. Uh, I went through and picked out uh, the oaks in, in that uh, a resource and uh, kind of organized them by uh, how common they are in the state. So the top, uh, the top is the most common and then kind of going down, if you look at their range uh, maps, Eastern two thirds, Eastern half, Eastern third, uh, so forth, uh, that kind of shows um, that a number of those oaks will do well in our areas. And some of my favorites, the bur oak, the chinkapin oak, uh, the dwarf chinkapin, I get schumard is also another great one. Uh, there are just so many great oaks to work with and, and they do attract insects. And so if you do want shade, you do want some canopy uh, built into your landscapes, oaks are a great way to start of thinking of those building blocks. Uh, you know, and, and this is just to highlight that uh, the plants that we grow, uh, in addition, uh, are, are the, the host for the caterpillars and what Ptolemy is talking about. And so, you know, the most famous one is the, is the monarch and how, you know, they like to especially lay their eggs on, on a common milkweed like there. And, you know, the more milkweed we have in our landscape, the more, uh, the, the better the chance the, the monarch uh, will have a survival. And that goes for any insect out there in the landscape all these moths and butterflies and 
the caterpillars they produce are, are, are part of that story. So thinking about those host plants, the vegetation uh, is, is very important. And then of course, we also wanna think of the flowers, uh, the nectar that is needed uh, if we really wanna have the Lepidoptera covered uh, as, um, because if we don't have Lepidoptera and we don't have the caterpillars that are producing there, we're not going to have the birds um, that we can host in our landscape as well. So it's all part of that food chain, that the idea that I'm trying to drive home. Here's a sort of a fun little story I like to, to share with uh, students when I'm hosting a field trip. I'll show this slide uh, to help drive home some of the different uh, critters that we might find in our landscape. So in my little uh, probably quarter acre or less uh, landscape, urban area in a, in a metropolitan area of 20,000 people, I have been able to attract all but one of these critters. Uh, I took two of these photos and, and three of the, the images are, are of others that, that I've seen in my yard. I'm guessing I'm just going to just give it away <laughs> right away in the interest of time that and I'm guessing that since I have a bunch of birders uh, out there, you'll probably easily pick that uh, no one would likely be able to get a, a meadowlark into their landscape uh, with uh, without sort of larger expanses of grassland and prairie. And that is true. I've never had a meadow meadowlark in my landscape, but I have had uh, this nearly two inch long uh, cicada killer wasp that, that landed on a picnic table as I was sitting out there one day. Uh, I do get to see uh, the uh, Great Plains skinks. I get to see praying mantis. I have a bat house that now has about uh, 16 uh, big brown bats, so uh, just right over my driveway. And I uh, get to see lots of uh, predatory insects like the assassin bug as well. So uh, that and, and many other insects are and, and critters are, are among the things that I love to see almost as, as much as uh, the, the plants and the, and the basis of that food chain uh, in my landscape. And you think when, the, when you have these plants that are attracting those critters that I just showed, uh, you also know that they're, in addition to flowers, they're producing interesting seed heads that provide uh, carbohydrates and, and food for, for animals, uh, for you know, small mammals, for seed eating birds that are trying to survive the winter. And uh, so we know that that is all part of that, that food chain we're gonna identify. Uh, so you all know local legend, Bob Grass and, and the great work that they're, that he and, and Judd Patterson and David Seibel are doing through Birds in Focus. And so you could consider the next coming slides as sort of a, uh, a commercial for, for Bob Gress and, and, and Judd and David and all the, the great photography work they do. Go to Birds in Focus and, and, and buy their photographs. They, they just do amazing work. It's great to have resources like them available to, 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 uh, for the rest of us to have education and enjoyment uh, of seeing the, the the immense amount of preparation and work that they do capturing these images of all these great birds that are out there. So uh, as we're putting the, the seeds in our yard, uh, we're attracting some of these species. Uh, uh, just show this sort of stock photo of a, of a goldfinch uh, chewing away in Maximilian sunflower seeds, uh, but they really are. It's a great bird feeder. I, I'm very uh, lazy in my bird feeding. I, I don't put uh, feeders out. Uh, I basically spend all my time trying to build a plant community to help bring these kind of birds in. And these are some of the seed eaters that I enjoy seeing uh, during the winter months uh, in my landscape. Uh, I also try to bring in uh, woodpeckers that, that I enjoy very much. Uh, I have lots of hackberries around my landscape with many different cavities that are mature uh, hackberries. And uh, I normally would get lots of these birds. I occasionally see some of these woodpeckers, but I have a big urban problem. And that urban problem is starlings. And uh, this would be a, a topic of conversation that I would love to have more uh, with any of you out there that are experiencing the, the same kind of thing. Uh, Jeff Hansen, a friend from Topeka, uh, he's now in South Dakota, but uh, he uh, undertook this study to uh, start trapping starlings. And uh, uh, it covers my, I can't see the, the total here, but I think that the, the bottom number is over 1,100 starlings that, he, that Jeff trapped over basically about a seven year period uh, to uh, trap and kill uh, uh, non-native European starlings. And when he did that, sure enough, all of a sudden, uh, the cavity nesters, like uh, many of these species you see here, started coming back. He started getting 
uh, flickers and woodpeckers and all sorts of other uh, now birds that are cavity nesters to come back into his landscape. And I wonder too, that uh, all these cavities that I have around in my hackberries around my landscape, that, that uh, all the dozens of starlings that, that are being raised there, that if I could uh, be more intentional about getting rid of them, that I might increase the bird diversity in my landscape as well. Something I've thought about, haven't, haven't acted on. But uh, uh, another interesting story when I think about uh, uh, attracting woodpeckers, I just visited my, my Uncle Royce down in southeastern uh, Kansas, uh, Independence area, and he's actually uh, one of the, the board members for Kansas Audubon down in that region. Uh, he was showing me the, the girdling of some trees he has on, on his property. He has an old uh, kind of a tree farm for KDOT uh, on, that they moved their house out to. And, uh, he, he has gotten into the habit of girdling trees, as you see in, in the middle uh, photo here, and the, the bark has all come off of it and that tree is dead. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, we were guessing by the size of that hole, probably of pileated woodpeckers. He sees them around a lot on his landscape. He also has seen uh, flickers going into this cavity. This is just a picture of a, a, a stock photo of a, of a pileated um, to kind of show the, the size of, of the holes that they produce. But it's a, another fun way to think about uh, attracting woodpeckers to your landscape. Instead of just cutting uh, trees down, uh, just go ahead and girdle them. Uh, strip off the bark at the base and, uh, and that tree will die and, and become uh, an insect for, or, or a haven for insects and, and woodpeckers as well. If you want to attract hummingbirds, which who doesn't? We like to put out uh, hummingbird feeders. Well, I've never put out a hummingbird feeder, but I do put out lots of plants that act as hummingbird feeders. Uh, some of these species include uh, these, uh, uh, some, some native and, and adaptable species. Um, the, a couple of honeysuckle, these are not the invasive problematic uh, uh, non-native honeysuckles, so uh, this uh, major wheeler variety of Lanissa sempervirens and uh, Lanissa reticulata, the Kinsley's ghost are these varieties that are, are great, they're well behaved, they climb up on a trellis on a fence and the, the places that I have them and I do love to see the, the hummingbirds that they attract. Uh, some, some wildflowers or forbs that you can plant to do this as well include uh, a couple from the mint family, uh, bee balm, Minarda fistulosa, pitcher sage or uh, blue salvia, we've, we've talked about that one as well. Uh, both those great tubular uh, mint flowers that uh, will attract uh, hummingbirds. You can think about uh, penstemon, there are a number of different uh, species and varieties of penstemons. And then uh, something like cardinal flower, the lobelias uh, also have that great uh, shape uh, for attracting hummingbirds as well. Just a few of the species to consider. Uh, if you think of, you know, uh, we've talked about the, the trees, we've talked about the understory, think about that shrub layer too, that as many different vegetation surfaces and layers that we can think of in our landscape, uh, the, the more we can, can fill those layers with vegetation and flowers and edible plants, uh, the more we're going to attract wildlife. So some favorites that come to mind, uh, starting in the top right. One of the earliest bloomers uh, uh, out there, usually uh, seeing it bloom in February, the, the vernal witch hazel, Hemimalus uh, vernalis uh, is, a, is one that you'll start to see bees and flies on early, early in the winter. Uh, another favorite later on in, in the summer uh, would be uh, buttonbush. You can see it little in wetter areas, likes its feet wet. Uh, just a, a huge butterfly magnet, uh, the, the flowers when, when they're in bloom. You can see both the flower on the left and more of the, the fruiting um, uh, structure, that beautiful red color on the right. Hazelnut is another one. Uh, think about, you know, birds that like uh, some of the larger nuts, uh, you know, blue jays, woodpeckers, and, and some of the kind uh, that would be a great, greatly attracted to things like hazelnut and the acorns of oaks too. Uh, and then you get the, the fruit eaters. Uh, anything that comes through later in the fall, you know, I think of cedar waxwings or, or many other fruit eaters. Uh, rough leaf dogwood is, is a great common shrub. Uh, that grows really well anywhere in Kansas and has nice fall color and berries. And, uh, and then uh, probably a, f a favorite of the viburnum would be uh, black high viburnum. More of an eastern Kansas species, but does really well here in the central parts as well. Uh, stunning flowers, very uh, uh, 
uh, nice vegetation and then those berries too, uh, just great features in, in, in some of these shrubs. But there are many, many more. The, uh, and then, you know, when you attract uh, some of those other critters with seeds and other vegetation and insects and small mammals, small birds, you're gonna get the other predators as well. So think about some of these urban predators, Cooper's hawk, sharp shinned, Eastern screech owl. Uh, I had <laughs> a great story coming out of my, uh, my backyard one night and uh, the, the bats were just kind of waking up and getting about ready to go out. You could hear them squeaking. And there was an Eastern screech owl sitting in my walnut branch about 15 feet away, just waiting for him to come out. And I was unfortunate that I, that I scared off the, the screech owl when I was trying to take a picture. Uh, but uh, it would have been interesting to see who would win between the, the big brown bats and the Eastern screech owl. I'm thinking we might have lost a, a bat or two uh, that night. But uh, anyway, just uh, part of that fascinating food web, you know, even in small little structure, small little lots in urban areas, some of the wildlife you can attract. And then I just, I can't emphasize enough how much we need to be changing our thought process about insects. I, uh, you know, being on some uh, Facebook uh, gardening uh, 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 groups lately, I see how much people are are focused on any time they see any kind of insects, whether it's grubs in the soil or whether it's, uh, you know, uh, a, a population of some other insect, how commonly the, the habit goes towards eliminating uh, species. What do I spray? What do I kind of powder do I put down and so forth? And there are very few uh, of insects that are really are a pest. And I think part of it is also just needing to change our mindset and to be think more inclusively of the insects that are out there. I'm just gonna finish now, run through really quickly with some best management practices for success, as you might think about doing more landscaping uh, uh, in your uh, urban backyard. Uh, define your goals, think about what you wanna do. That's very helpful to get started. So are you going to be more horticultural uh, or are you going to be more ecological? And of course, these are two of uh, the extremes that you would see on a continuum. Usually you'd wanna land somewhere uh, right in the middle. And you can be thinking about, you know, what we do some at the Arboretum, there are areas where we do have some monocultures of native plants. Here's uh, Echinacea purpurea. Uh, here on the island, a uh, little patch of gray-headed coneflower. Uh, sometimes, you know, you do get a little bit of farming of, of you know, one species in an area, and that's okay. Uh, just just mix it up and do that differently in different places. Sometimes you will mix the species, but you'll do uh, uh, waves of, of certain things like you see in the, that Penstemon uh, digitalis there, um, and, you know, and spotting some of the others uh, like you'd have in this catmint uh, on the left. And then sometimes you just get more wild. This was maybe a garden that uh, 15 years ago was more intentional with waves, but over time plants move and, and that's been okay. We would kind of like this area to be sort of a little bit more of a wild prairie area. So may, things you can think about in defining your goals. Uh, start small, you wanna have success. We're not trying to create an exhibit of the World's Fair. We really, you can always get bigger, but don't start too big because it will overwhelm you and you're not going to have fun. And gardening uh, is supposed to be fun. I just wrote a blog post on our, our website at dickarboretum.org uh, about garden small, be intentional. And that, that one was just posted. Uh, see that if you wanna kind of think more about uh, that starting small mindset. Preparing the site. Uh, there is very little preparation that usually needs to happen. If you do have a sunny area and it's not been an irrigated fescue, you may have Bermuda grass. I do not like to use chemicals. Let me just state that. You probably have gotten that idea from me. The one time that I will give in to using a, an herbicide treatment is to rid an area of Bermuda grass first. I, I cannot say how frustrating it is to try to uh, promote native plants in an area when you have uh, Bermuda grass uh, infested everywhere in the area. So uh, maybe a couple of, of applications of glyphosate uh, during the growing season months of July, August, or September uh, can be helpful in, in getting started in that way. One of the, the trade-offs that I have in trying to uh, be ecologically sound, uh, but still uh, try to meet the goals of, of what I'm doing uh, with these plantings. I would not recommend this approach that I learned early on. Uh, cultivation is just a lot of work and all it does is stirs up a lot of weed seeds. So uh, 
I would rather uh, kind of kill off the area, plant into that matrix of uh, dead vegetation, uh, I think you'll be much more successful. Thinking about hardscaping, uh, those elements are important to build into your landscape. Thinking about where you want to sit, artwork, feeders, bird feeders, uh, those kinds of things, planting tools. But my favorite uh, and the most important to me is that AM Leonard Soil Knife uh, for $20 to $30. You should have that in your uh, toolbox of landscaping if you're interested. I, I find it very helpful. Art in the garden. Uh, I won't say more about that, but it's always nice to include that cultural human element as well. Uh, getting edgy. This is one that's very important. Uh, you can see here some of the early gardens we did with schools. I uh, can look pretty weedy and it's hard to know where the garden starts and the lawn starts. And uh, so being able to provide that, uh, that edge can be very important and make a, a garden much more aesthetically pleasing. You can see before and after of, of gardens where the edging uh, hasn't been and then is, and it makes a big difference. So just some examples of different kinds of edging that you can consider that really uh, help make these uh, more aesthetically pleasing places to work in. Selecting the plants. Uh, you're not going to have success if you don't choose the right plants. Think about spacing, think about at least uh, you know, one plant per, per two to three square feet or so, kind of generally comes to a range of about a dollar or two per square foot if you're thinking about that. Be thinking about moisture on your landscape, wet areas would need plants that like their feet wet more so. Uh, think about sunlight. Uh, the south side of a house certainly is going to be more prone to prairie species than the north side where you would certainly want shade species. So to probably seem like really obvious things, but, but they're things that to be, need to be very mindful of when you start to think about spending time and money on creating a landscape. And like our, our plant guide that we have for our plant sales helps give a lot of those details of the height and the bloom time, the moisture regime and so forth that are helpful. And also we do a lot of kind of suggesting plants that work well together, planting in, in swaths or, or groupings and the like. So uh, lots of, lots of uh, advice there uh, through our plant sales and, and through our website, newsletters and so forth. Uh, we're just on the cusp of our plant sale now. Uh, we're very busy getting ready for that and we'd love to see you come out. Thursday the 22nd is our Members Day sale and then the 23rd through the 25th is open to the public. So come out to Heston and enjoy that. Careful watering, you got to remember that these plants are in pots, those are small root systems. Even though these are native plants that will live a long time, you have to have time to develop those deep roots and know that in the beginning, they're very susceptible, need to be watered regularly, and uh, you need to, to do that regularly in the first couple of years until you can get those deep root systems developed. Uh, being mindful of where your water sources are and where your downsports are and uh, um, and being close to the left and maybe not close to the right if you're not doing a rain garden um, can be helpful. No need to fertilize. These plants uh, do uh, not need lots of supplemental fertilizer. Basically, you're fertilizing just that top six inches where the weeds are anyway, so uh, don't worry about that. Adding mulch can be very helpful in the early years of a, a native planting uh, to help keep the weeds down, help keep uh, moisture at the, at the roots of, of your young perennial plants that are putting down roots. Uh, so um, being in touch with a mulch supply is very helpful in those early years of any native garden. Um, and then uh, mulching tools, some of the things I found that work really well, the, um, those three tools right there, very good, yes, big thumbs up. Uh, the typical pitchfork, uh, the, the scoop shovel, not so good, not helpful. Uh, so um, something to think about there. Newspaper, it gives you a little bit of another weed barrier under mulch. I'm not a big fan of, of the long-term uh, weed barrier that exists for many, many years. It can be more of a pain than it's worth, it's expensive, and it doesn't always give the product that you're, or the result that you're wanting. Some people like it, I don't. I'd prefer newspapers and mulch and, and going that route. Signage can be very helpful, uh, an educational tool. Here are just some examples of some things uh, that I would promote from some, some uh, organizations that I really like too. And so they look nice and they're educational. And weeding. Can't say enough about weeding. If you don't like to weed, native, native landscaping is not for yours, not for you. You need to, to take the attitude of this, uh, this strong-minded and strong-bodied young student uh, that weeding can be fun and it uh, is, is very helpful to your uh, native landscaping efforts. So 
there's some weeding tips. You can come back and look at those later. I'm just going to cut to questions and uh, would love to chat more about your thoughts on native landscaping in your backyard. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brad. That was an incredible presentation. I'm going to echo the sentiments of some of the folks in our comment section saying, wow, I've learned so many tips and I have so many ideas now. <laughs> um, and we do have some questions for you. And, and maybe I'll lead off with this very first one from Dan Rogers on YouTube, kind of related to the plant sale and some things you mentioned, but he wants to know where to get seeds or plants described in the native, this native plant discussion. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we, we love our source, uh, one of the largest native plant uh, uh, sources in the state at Dick Arboretum of the Plains in Heston, Kansas. Uh, but there are some other, uh, some growing nurseries I know in the, you know, the, uh, the Lawrence area, there's some nurseries that are coming around. Uh, and uh, in the upper Midwest, there are a number of great, uh, both plant and seed nurseries. Uh, too many to name, but if you go to, to Kansas Native Plant Society org uh, KNPS, you will find uh, lots more information there about uh, you know seed sources, plant sources, and so forth. Um, on the board there uh, at KNPS, a bunch of great people, really knowledgeable, uh, and and so much is is conveyed through that website. So check that out as well. Awesome. Um, Carla Dill wants to know if we can share or if you can share the full graph of steps again, please. I think that uh, they must be referring to the weeding steps that just happened or if it was the flow chart, let me know, Carla, and I can relay that to Brad. But we could have that up while uh, we're asking you some questions here. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I could just... Uh... I could just quickly look at the last, uh, the few slides there, if you wanted to uh, see some of the uh, the elements there of, of weeding. Um, I'll just, I'll quickly go through them since there was oh, a specific okay. question. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, regular weeding is best. I mean, it becomes a chore if you, if you wait too long in between weeding times when weeding uh, takes too much time, it's backbreaking and so forth. If you get out there, Every week, even every day, it, it makes it more fun and it's uh, it's definitely more sustainable. Uh, get as much of the root as possible, minimize soil disturbance. As I said, soil disturbance uh, creates germination of more weed seeds. So uh, try to do that. That's where the digging tools come in handy at cutting the root and pulling it out without pulling up a, a huge clump of soil. Uh, annuals, uh, you can do, keep from disturbing the soil at all if you just uh, cut it right at the base. It's most likely not going to, to reflower again if it's if it's just starting to flower. So that can be one way of also uh, you know making weeding easier rather than trying to pull out a, a big root ball as well. Uh, if uh, removing seed heads is another one, like say perennials that are a bit weedy, uh, you can just cut off the seed heads at the end of the season. And if you do have uh, really problematic weeds, make sure you don't uh, leave the flowers because sometimes they have enough energy to still produce seeds uh, in the garden. And then uh, breaking off spent flowering stems if na if natives are unsightly is another tip as okay. well. So I'll, awesome. I'll leave it there. Yep. Could we also take a look at the flow chart too, just to get a last little screenshot of all those different tips you had? And uh, I've got a really fantastic question from Laura about trying to bridge the gap between people and insects <laughs> in their gardening. Okay, great. Um, I will try to, let's try to, yeah, go ahead. No worries. Okay, there's the, there's the last, if everybody can see that. Awesome, yeah, that's perfect. Um, some of the things to think about. Yeah. And I have a, I have a blog post that I, I, I don't remember exactly what the site is, but I, I, I do cover a lot of these steps. In, in so post. it's in the comments section now. Okay. Um, okay. Unless, I'm sorry, unless it was something, a different one, but um, yeah. Okay, sorry. But coming back to some of these tips as well, I, I'd be, if, if anybody is, uh, I, if anybody has specific questions, don't hesitate to send me an email. I'd be happy to respond and, and give some more feedback to specific, specific examples or, or questions and, and share details from some other uh, blog posts or, or whatever. Uh, so yeah, maybe we'll just go on to the next question. I can, I, can, I can follow up with folks if they have 
more questions. Yeah. So Laura Mendenhall wants to know uh, this. She says, a lot of times when I talk to suburbanites about the need to plant natives so they can host more insects that can feed the birds like the chickadees, um, they recoil in fear of A, writhing masses of bugs and larvae all over their yard, and B, trees completely defoliated by caterpillars. Um, so she would like to know, uh, can you offer some descriptions that would counter these so that she can better assuage some of those fears? Hmm. <clears throat> what <clears throat> what kind of writhing masses did you say of, of larvae? Um, bugs and larvae, just I, I think the general concept of it, maybe it's because we have such a reaction to the concept of grubs and, yeah. and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I've never seen, you know, even though we'll see sometimes trees will get, you'll see pretty hard evidence of defoliation of, on a tree. I don't know of trees absolutely being killed by insects. I mean, okay, we have historic examples, you know, the, the gypsy moth or, you know, um, us, uh, what, what are some others that historically have like killed off groups of trees? But today, you know, even like, uh, you know, those little uh, uh, tent caterpillars or the, uh, the little the bagworms on cedars, I know that they can have an impact, uh, but still, I've never actually seen a killing of a tree uh, in that sense. So I think that there might be a bit of overreaction with the, the full impact that it can have on some of our, you know, our, our trees and our landscapes. And, uh, and so I, I think that maybe just changing a little bit of the mindset and, and, thinking that more of the damage that we can do by trying to get rid of groups of insects uh, and uh, and taking more of that approach. Uh, and I had a kindergarten teacher at our EPS program that I think that that stated it best of our views of insects. She would like to teach kids to say, ooh, instead of ooh, when they when they see insects. So um, that's that's something that I that I like to to repeat from her. And uh, and I think it's something that we could take to heart in our in our urban landscapes as well that that we should have more of an open mind with insects that they're not going to to be the scourge that's going to kill off our landscape yeah no that's a great approach just changing your mindset completely i like i love that the, the idea that you're doing more harm by removing them than they would do to your yard in the first place um mm -hmm. that's fantastic uh does anybody have any additional questions for Brad before we let him go? Uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Uh, but I'm gonna thank you again, Brad, because this was a fantastic presentation. I can't believe how much I've learned and how many books I have now that I need to start collecting. I didn't realize that we had savannas in Kansas historically and uh, like just so much that's, it, it was a delight and uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, Laura says, preach, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Thank you. <laughs> In response to your question. Well, um, thank, you thanks for your, it. thanks for the meme you added to my, uh, <laughs> my collection of how I communicate with people now. I think I'm just going to start sending off that meme to everybody from now on. So. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I do actually have one more question from me for, mm -hmm. for you, sorry, from Karen. Uh, what is your advice about non-native insects like Japanese beetles? Yes, yeah, so we are starting to see some of these, uh, you know, species that will come in like that, and it's the same sort of, uh, you know, wrestling that I have of of approach of how 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 hands on should we be, you know, as I as I, as like I alluded to with the starlings, you know, how much do we try to play, you know, the puppet master uh, when it comes to how we how we manage non native species. And, you know, we do tend to weed out non-native species of plants. So should we be considering doing that uh, with insects as well? I would say that if they if they do get to the point where they're becoming problematic and we're starting to lose species in our landscape because of them, then we can maybe be thinking about probably the, the maybe the least invasive uh, approach to trying to tackle them as much as possible. For some reason, I don't I don't see as many Japanese beetles here as like say my relatives in Denver do, um, and it's like I don't know do they kind of jump over the plains a little bit, in, as they move from from east to west? 
I don't know exactly for sure, but I know that they they see some defoliation of like say Virginia creeper climbing up some of their aspens or something like that, mm -hmm. but it doesn't kill the Virginia creeper, you know. And um, again, I think it will probably we'll see it defoliating some some landscape plants, but I don't think that's going to completely kill them. And you know, and those beetles may be food for other you know critters as well. So I think kind of uh, sort of doing a little bit of wait and see. There's not too much we can do about it. If we try to start spraying pesticides or trying to kill off just that particular uh, species of beetle, we're going to probably have a much wider net that we'll cast of killing lots of other insects as well that we probably don't want to do. So I would say uh, that we should be uh, conservative and slow in our approach and how we respond to those things because it's, there's, there's not much else that we can do about it. So maybe just not overreact right to begin with. Sure. And maybe the most ecologically mindful way to respond if people feel like they need to respond would be just anything that doesn't involve pesticides, maybe. Or um, uh, Todd Volkman is also going to point out in the comments, for those of you who don't see this because you're on YouTube, um, that the Japanese beetles are often confused for the green June beetles in the area too. So that's even more reason to take that conservative approach. Thanks for pointing that out, Todd. Um, Great point, Todd. Yeah, yeah I, I see more of the the green the green June beetles than I do the the Japanese beetles in my landscape. And I've had birds dive at me because a gr green June beetle just happened to be flying by my head, and they were going after it. So. Uh, for our bird lovers out here, <laughs> you know. A few years ago, yeah. when I when I learned about my first green June beetle in the garden, I was so enamored with it, I wrote a blog post on it because I thought it was just the coolest big beetle out there. And I, I learned I learned a lot just doing a little research on it. And so, yeah. yeah. Um, if you guys aren't subscribed to the Dick Arboretum uh, newsletter, highly recommend that so you can get some wonderful writings in your email inbox. Uh, and uh, check out other blog posts besides the one that's linked up in the comments. And you can find Brad's contact information there too, his email address and stuff if you have further questions. Um, but seeing no additional questions now, uh, I'm gonna call it and we're gonna let you go. And hopefully you see some people in this audience out at the plant sale this weekend. Yeah, and don't hesitate to follow up with questions. I, I'd love to continue the conversations with, with any of you, so. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Brad, and thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll see you later. Have a good night. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> okay, I had to end both streams. Okay, we're good.